Um, I'm very, very pleased to welcome Femke Snelting, um, who works as an artist and designer, developing projects at the intersection of design, feminisms, and free software. In various constellations, she explores how digital tools and practices might co-construct each other. She's a member of Constant, a non-profit artist-run association for art and media based in this very city of Brussels. Uh, since 1997, Constant generates performative publishing, curatorial processes, poetic software, experimental research, and educational prototypes in local and international contexts. With Yara Rocha, she activates Possible Bodies, a collective research project that interrogates the concrete and at the same time fictional entities of bodies in the context of 3D tracking, modeling, and scanning. Welcome, Femke. <laughs> this is super imposing, this lighting. Um, so I'll try to get the nerves down. Um, so thank you for uh, opening again. Uh, the Medusa's, uh, uh, the Medusa of copyri copyright. Uh, it's an issue that uh, Constant, the organization I will speak for and with today, um, has been busy with uh, for almost 20 years now. Uh, so, as I, uh, as we spoke just in the morning, like, are you looking forward to this, uh, this panel? I was both dreading it and uh, <laughs> being excited to have uh, companions to discuss with. Um, dreading because, of course, it is a complicated issue, as uh, Melissa already announced, uh, and in a way we also sensed through the uh, presentation just before. Uh, dreading also because we're in, after 20 years of aligning with uh, copyleft practices, so alternatives to copyright, and I will explain a bit more later, uh, we are uh, facing um, a sort of flip where we see that the the generative uh, qualities of this move actually need to be reviewed and we have to somehow start again. So um, we need some allies here. Uh, so I speak from Constant. Uh, Constant is an association, uh, so that means it's a collective of collectives active in Brussels since 97. Uh, so really at the beginning of many uh, activists thinking about what the networks could do, what digital practice would mean. Um, Constant works somewhere on the fields between art, artistic practice, technology uh, and media. So many of the questions, uh, of course, come back to copyright uh, if we want it or not. And we do that uh, from three different angles. Um, one is important, uh, is maybe the most important, is uh, to work from feminisms, to try to use feminist theory, thinking, practice, uh, as a way to um, look at technology for its power structures, for the way it uh, produces bias, for the way uh, it produces worlds. Then a second is uh, to to think and rethink authorship. Um, so we're interested in, from this feminist uh, background, in somehow thinking about authorship in a way that could tie it to other authors, so to somehow have a relational thinking. And this is not a status quo, we think it's political choice. Um, and then thirdly, uh, since uh, the 2000s, uh, we have decided to work with free software as a result of those positions. So what does that mean? Um, as a response to the problems we saw, we saw with copyright, seeing that it would, that was tied to property, that it would uh, always favor the individual artist, and uh, was um, um, thought through, uh, let's, let's say, a market, um, uh, tainting of authorship, we we got very excited about the proposals that were being made, both in uh, the context of free software, and in the context of uh, alternative ar alternative art practices. So the most let's say the first proposals, legal proposals, to use existing 
conventional copyright to actually hack it by adding another license, which would be a free license. So you have to understand it really in the terms of hacking, in the sense of using the existing copyright system to attach another, like to reroute uh, the uh, that we that what what was not working within conventional copyright through another layer of licensing. <laughs> And so what it means is that someone that has the legal right to call him or herself the author of a work can then decide to add another license that would, instead of keeping the authored work to him or herself, then would give permission uh, to uh, reuse, uh, remake, distribute, etc. So in the case of free software, so where I think this practice has become the most widespread and, uh, and successful, you could say. Uh, this means that anyone can study a software program, which is important not just uh, to learn from, but also to critique, for example. So it means that you have ways of critiquing the way uh, software is done. Um, and that critique is not just through studying, but also through using. So it's uh, the prax praxis that Marta made important is, this, is com uh, this combination of study and use, which for us is very important. And then um, it allows you to make changes, which means no object is seen as final. Everything can be taken up and then remade. Um, of course, the, let's say the, the success of this model has to do with that it's also an efficient model because it means that you don't have to start from scratch every time again. And with digital material objects, it means that you can just make a copy and then uh, go on from that. But if you hear, uh, if you listen closely to the way I explain uh, um, a free copy, uh, like a free uh, software license, I, of course, explain it as almost a feminist project. And this was our excitement. We saw it as a way to think about technology and to through use and study and remaking. And this uh, was very important and generative. Very soon after the invention of uh, this legal hack in free software, uh, people in art and creative production started to th think about implementing uh, some of the ideas that had been around for a long time in situationist practice, for example, that is uh, traditionally always been anti-copyright, um, to implement those uh, for artistic production. And so this is where projects like Free Art License were born, that are they're totally inspired on this free software mode, but try to uh, uh, port it to artistic practice. And so it means, for example, me being filmed here uh, is done under a free art license, which of course is super complicated because we don't know what that means, uh, that I'm speaking, I'm speaking with you, what is your license, what is the license of this situation. But it's just a kind of way of talking about how we would like to transform the world through legal documents. So this, these early days, uh, let's say until I, th I would say 2008, nine maybe, um, and these, these legal documents produced lots of discussions, lots of thinking about what does it mean to be an author? Um, what does it mean to credit? What does it mean to uh, uh, share your resources? What is a resource? Where does it end? Where does it begin? Who has that responsibility? Who pays for it? How do you make a living? All these kind of questions were very vibrant and again, generative. Um, for us it was important also because it was an affirmative mode. It was not, let's say, we were never against appropriation without license, but it was a way we could somehow work with instead of working against. Um, and uh, so to, to kind of uh, imagine the law and how it could work uh, was a, is a practice that we feel uh, as an organization, as an association, as a group of people that that uh, is interested in uh, in a, in public institutions, in uh, how we can share, um, not just illegally but also legally, uh, was interesting to do. So um, right now uh, the situation has changed. It has changed 
over time, of course, because those, those discussions, this generative mode has faded away largely. And we've come down to from what in the early days were like hundreds of different license proposals that some were legally uh, binding, some not at all, some were just performative, some were um, uh, invented by lawyers, some were done written by artists, and all these different modes of interfacing with the law uh, were actually uh, creating those discussions. Right now, the debate has gone back to the the space of the lawyers or the legislators um, that are making good money with the complications of contemporary uh, life in digital, like com contemporary digital life. The situations are in the, the complications that we found interesting have actually become uh, so complicated that many people have decided to not even care anymore whether their work uh, and in what way their work was licensed. So, with Constant, we have decided to reopen <laughs> this question. So it doesn't mean we want to desert uh, the, the proposal of uh, free licenses, but we think it is time to think again. And so there's a few questions we have and we want to ask uh, in our next wave of reinventing uh, these legal documents, uh, which is first of all related to how we could think about legalizing uh, relational authorship. It's very clear not just uh, that authorship is not just relational between people, uh, but it also relation relational between machines and people, between people, machines and resources. Uh, you could say um, Coltan is somehow involved in our author product production and how to, um, how to deal with that. Again, I'm not talking about a solution, I, d I couldn't care less, but about a discussion that could somehow become interesting again. Uh, the second question is how could we make sure that um, authorship, and I'm, I'm clearly not talking about copyright, but it, because again, copyright is not interesting, authorship is interesting. And then how can the law somehow um, provide spaces for interesting forms of authorship? So how could authorship uh, proliferate again? In the sense of authorship that is both writing and reading, is somehow taking, making use of, this, of the possibilities of being able to read and write in a digital environment. So not just read or not just write, but uh, actually the spaces in between. Uh, and we see there's big problems, uh, um, like if you think about how uh, uh, academic material is being copyrighted at the moment and not be, uh, uh, is both funded by public funding and then resold to large publishers uh, and even more um, um, uh, worrying is that uh, academic authors that want to publish under an open license uh, now have to pay these commercial entities to actually do so. So it's a flip of the situation. There's also the problem that platform capitalists like uh, um, uh, the, big, the big ones such as the alphabet companies are actually interested in banishing copyright. So this is not in the interest of uh, authorship. Uh, this is in the interest of the flow of um, uh, the products from authorship. And this, I think, we, something we need to be very careful with. So that our, uh, how do we reorient our uh, anti conventional copyright activism so that we don't feed uh, that uh, ideology. So it's about politics. <laughs> um, then of course we're interested in, in decoupling the relation between property and authorship for sure. I mean it's come up uh, again and again and we see that the, uh, the fact that the, the legal hack is based on uh, conventional copyright, pulls it back into both individual authors, authorship and uh, an understanding of authorship as property. And I think if we read um, the invitation to this day with those eyes, you see how easily we equate copyright with a market relation. And I think there's, there's much more to say about how authorship functions in the world. And I think we need to 
yeah, I would like to uh, see how we could formulate laws that could do that. And again, like if you look at the, at the link tax um, regulations and the way it easily um, follows uh, this understanding of copyright as only an economic relation, uh, you can see how, how dangerous that actually is. But also in the decoupling of authorship from property, uh, we have some important uh, post-colonial work, a critique to uh, follow up on. That is like only starting uh, these kind of discussions and are actually quite um, um, uh, difficult to find in uh, copyleft activism. Uh, this kind of s like serious looking at what are the colonial relations between property and authorship. And then last but not least, how can we be involved in this? Um, like the, the problem is, of course, that, that um, these kind of re regulations are not thought from uh, supporting authorship anymore. They came from there, but there's an, uh, there's an understanding of authorship that is uh, uh, of a very different kind than we would understand it right now. If only it's super humanist, it's, it's, it's French Revolution kind of idea of, uh, of authorship, so we need to rethink that. But how to do that in a way that we're not needing to excuse ourselves for not being specialists. So, um, as a beginning of this, and to try uh, and overcome my dread, I brought you uh, two proposals, not by Constant, by other organizations, uh, to make very different licenses, and I would like to read them with you. So I have copies for you. Copies. You don't have to read with me, you can, but uh, so you have something to bring home. So the first um, is um, anonymous in the sense that it's published on the Free Culture uh, Foundation website. Uh, and it's called the De Decolonial Media License 0 0.1. Um, so it starts showing up, in, especially in people that are, of course, involved in uh, post-colonial critique or de decolonial work. Uh, when they want to uh, license their work, then these licenses start to appear. I'm not saying it's... A, it's a, I don't know, this is the way to go, but it's interesting to see the tensions and uh, paradoxes that come up in this document. So first of all, this... Legally, this license is doing exactly the same trick as a free, free art license, the license that I'm currently speaking under. Uh, so it says, in the, under the what does this mean, it says you are free to use, to make use of this work. You can study it, so meaning you can examine it. You can share it, so you can distribute it, and you can adapt it. So there's different ways of saying the same thing uh, that you re recognize in free software licenses and, and other open content licenses. The other important thing that is also in the free art license is that uh, the idea is that those licenses are generative, meaning once something falls under that license, every subsequent, subsequent co copy or remaking falls under that same license too. So how to solve that, I don't know, but at least a part of the film that's being produced as we speak will need to fall under this license. Um, but then it says why, and I'll read. We recognize that private ownership over media, it's not clear by the way who this we is, uh, and technology is rooted in European conceptions of property and the hist history of colonialism from which they formed. These systems of privatization and monopolization, namely copyright and patent law, enforce the system of punishment and reward, which benefit a privileged minority at the cost of others' creative expression, political discourse, and cultural survival. The private and public institutions, legal frameworks, and social values which uphold these systems are inseparable from broader forms of oppression. 
indigenous people, people of color, queer people, trans people and women are particularly exploited for their creative and cultural resources while hardly receiving any of the personal gains or legal protection of their work. So they connect uh, copyright not to the individual authorship but to a much larger understanding of authorship and I think that's an interesting proposal. Uh, the second uh, document, and these are pseudo-legal documents, although I think the first one might actually hold in court. Um, the second document is called the Media Piracy in Emer uh, uh, me No, sorry, the Consumer Dilemma License, sorry. The Consumer's Dilemma License. And it uses, if you're familiar with open content licenses, uh, it refers to Creative Commons logo. So it uses the same type of style. Um, it was published in a book uh, by Janis Karanis, uh, a researcher who is looking at media piracy and its consequences, trying to somehow um, break the, 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 the binary stance of, let's say, legality, non-legality, uh, good for business, bad for business, all these kinds of uh, binaries. And so his book was funded by uh, the Canadian Research Co Council, uh, a Canadian Research Council, and he starts the book that is uh, you can uh, find online uh, with uh, this co consumer's dilemma license. So he says the full text PDF version of the report is available for eight dollars for non-commercial use in high-income countries a list that for the present purposes includes the United States, Western Europe, Japan, Australia, Israel, Singapore, and several of the Persian Gulf states, but not Canada. This is a joke. <laughs> it's free for non-commercial use outside the above listed high income countries. It costs $2,000 for commercial end use in any location defined as use by businesses that realize financial gain from film, music, software or publishing and or the enforcement of copyrights thereof with annual revenues greater than 1 million US dollars. Volume licensing is available. So then it goes on and then violations of the terms of the license are subject to prosecution under applicable law. For US residents, this includes criminal prosecution under the No Electronic Theft, the NET Act, which is basically what he's critiquing in his book, punishable by up to five years in prison and 250,000 in fines per act of infringe infringement. And then he ends the license with saying, for those who must have it for free anyway, you probably know where to look. 